Brene Brown, a qualitative researcher, has said that stories are data with a soul. So today I'm going to share some of the stories of the participants in the NYU Cancer Anxiety Study. So my hope is that these stories will help the quantitative data come alive in a new way and enrich your understanding of our work. And perhaps also you'll find a part of yourselves in the stories. The outcome of these trials uh, are demonstrating that something is working. So we, mo we know that positive change is happening. Anxiety scores are going down. However, little is still known about the healing process itself. What is it that is changing emotionally and psychologically um, that's producing these dramatic and sustained effects that we're observing? So in other words, what's happening in between these data points, in between you know, before treatment and after treatment, we're measuring data throughout, you know, beginning and throughout, but we really don't know what's going on with uh, the participants and patients uh, throughout the process. Our qualitative team set out to systematically explore the healing process in the NYU parent study with a method called interpretive phenomenological analysis, or IPA. And we propose the following questions. What is it like to go through this process? How is healing occurring? Uh, the IPA method is committed to maintaining the authenticity of patients' experiences. However, it also recognizes that at times our participants struggle to express what they're thinking and feeling, and therefore, to a degree, the researchers have to interpret what they're saying. So in essence, the participants are trying to make sense of their world, and we, the researchers, are trying to make sense of the world of the participant. <laughs> So IPA considers that we can't do this directly. So what we do is we gather this information through a process of interpretive activity. So this creates a natural amount of bias in our understanding. Uh, so Alex is a, a doctoral fellow in the Department of Applied Psychology at NYU. He's really been like the fearless leader of our project. Sarah Pilgreen. She's a, a PhD student in social welfare at UCLA. Cody, he has studied existential phenomenological psychology. Ms. Shea, she just received her PhD from UPenn in comparative literature. She's now a postdoc at the University of Puget Sound. Our qualitative expert consultant, Harris Friedman, he's a professor of psychology at the University of Florida and Goddard College, also very looped in with existential humanistic psychology. And then there's me, my photo's not there, but um, I'm, a, I'm a PhD student at uh, Palo Alto University and um, I'm studying the intersections between meditation and psychology. The primary objective of our parent study was to assess the efficacy and safety profile of psilocybin in conjunction with psychotherapy for anxiety associated with a cancer diagnosis. Each participant had two drug administration sessions, one a placebo, one with psilocybin, and they were randomized. And the qualitative interview was an optional portion that was offered to participants. At the end of the study, about half of our participants were interviewed. Um, one one week after their second dosing session, um, which could have been psilocybin or placebo, um, and that the other half were interviewed about a year out. So each participant was asked to describe their experience of the session on which they thought they received the psilocybin. So we asked them to describe their experiences in detail and specific questions address perceptual, emotional, and memory experiences, as well as their hopes for the study. We have just submitted one of probably at least two papers for um, submission to a journal. We divided them into general, typical, and variant. The general themes, as you can see, are the ones that occurred in the most participants. There were 13 total participants. Here's a list of the themes that we found after we coded the data for patterns within the themes. Eight participants described the pattern of trying to find a way to cope with the emotional distress related to their diagnosis and treatment. The distress they spoke about was usually akin to trauma, similar to the symptoms of PTSD. Their attempts to manage this distress were painful and more often unsuccessful. And it usually involved various forms of emotional avoidance. So when the participants were invited to join the parent study, um, they expressed a really urgent desire to find a better way to, to cope and for better strategies. So one participant said, quote, 
There's nothing in place to help people after it's done. They medicate you, they do the surgeries, but then it's done, and it's trauma. Your life is completely different. Another participant said, quote, I felt like a part of me was dying. I was walking around in my body and doing my job and having good times, but I was not really living. So if you're not really living, maybe part of me was dying. In articulating his hopes for the study, one man said he was looking for a channel to spiritual healing. In his words, he was, quote, looking for a pathway that I would be able to revisit and thereby come to terms with a terminal diagnosis in a dignified way. Another man said, quote, it feels like there's a battlefield inside of me. And, and I'm not sure who the warriors are, but it just feels like there's a war going on inside me. You know, the participants were very focused on finishing the treatment, but then after that, they, they didn't know where to focus their attention. So, you know, our team's interpretation from these testimonies, physical diagnosis related to the body also lays its claim on psychological and emotional health. Um, so I, I, I like to call it that th there was a lot of emotional scar tissue that was unattended to. All 13 participants reported having felt a, a wide range of significant emotions during their sessions that they said were unique or beyond what they were able to access in their daily lives. One participant even said he, quote, experienced all the emotions I know how to experience. Another said she felt, quote, all of them, all of them, every possible emotion. Another person described feeling a sense of unity among a wide range of contradic contradicting emotion, saying, quote, I felt a kind of joy and sorrow all at once. It wasn't like woe is me, sorrow, or gr grotesque sorrow. It was a wash of sadness of the beauty of life and that I've had the joy and pleasure of experiencing this wash of experience. I felt indescribably sad, grateful, and joyful all at once. Two participants said the experience brought to mind old memories that they hadn't thought of in years, but had carried around with them as unspoken, and they called it, quote, emotional baggage. Uh, one patient grieved a broken relationship with his father, and for the first time since he was six years old, he cried uh, during his session and, and, this, um, and felt an enormous sense of relief afterward. Another participant was able to tap into feelings related to a childhood sexual trauma, and this had been festering beneath the surface for decades. For the first time in her adult life, she was able to articulate this area of ongoing pain and bring it to light in her therapy sessions that she had after the psilocybin session. So as you can see, um, the participants are describing uh, a process, or this emotional process, as a sort of amplification of emotional content. Um, but actually content that was felt to already exist inside oneself but was brought to the surface by psilocybin. It appears that the, here that the drug is not used to fabricate a, a new experience but rather to reunite one with the world of emotion that exists inside of them. Psilocybin allowed our participants to unlock these emotions and in doing so they seem to gain a sense of agency by first becoming aware of their feelings, they were able to work through them during the session and afterward in therapy. Additionally, this process modeled and showed them that they can experience intense emotions and work through them to a point where they are not so overwhelming. All of our participants described um, insights or transformations involving significant personal relationships. The pattern we found is that in their psilocybin experiences, they came to see their loved ones in a new way. And these relational vision, visions or moments of connection 
brought upon feelings of acceptance and forgiveness and allowed them to move into more expansive feelings of love and peace towards others and wholeness within themselves. Two participants talked about the defenses and barriers they had created to hide their pain and suffering from their loved ones because they didn't want to burden them. Um, but they came to see how these strategies had been limiting for themselves and their relationships. One woman expressed, quote, when I got ill, I tried to protect everyone by pushing them away from me because I didn't want them to carry the weight of what I was going through. I felt it was my fight, and I had to go through it alone. So now, I understand that this is why they've been walking on eggshells, because I created this. I need to just allow them to come in. Another participant who had experienced many years of emotional distance from his wife was able to persist in his desire for connection and intimacy with her after his psilocybin session and um, able to communicate his relational needs without the fear of rejection to his wife. In the middle of a typical tension-filled conversation with his wife, he finally said, quote, I just need a hug. I'm trying to cope with just being here, and I feel overwhelmed. He continued, Slowly she got the idea of the profundity of what I was asking for in a simple hug. And he described this moment as, quote, an opportunity to change the way we've done business for years. One woman described how during the psilocybin session, she was able to explore the cancer experience through the eyes of her husband, um, giving her a more holistic perspective, saying, quote, I saw everything as a whole, a whole image like a camera panning out and seeing it all. She went on to say, quote, I never took into consideration what he went through. Yeah, I went through cancer. Yeah, he was there for me. But I never understood or thought about his selflessness and everything else that was involved in it. He didn't have time to deal with his own emotions and the effect that it had on him. Interestingly, in addition to being the loving husband that she described, she was also dealing with the fact that he had at some point pursued an affair while she was in treatment. And, you know, and even thinking about uh, a transgression like this makes, you know, I'm sure, us all feel a little judgmental about him. However, uh, the power of this experience allowed her to see and feel, see and feel the situation from his perspective. And in doing so, she was able to bring true understanding and compassion to him as well as to herself. So my, my commentary on this is, um, in the relational space we share with others is also impacted by the, uh, the cancer's experience. And sometimes, you know, barring down an old long-standing problems, increasing feelings of isolation, and bringing with it many challenges for intimacy. But by tapping into the safety of um, their love shared with others, our participants were able to make themselves vulnerable and open up to deeper feelings of acceptance and forgiveness. And they were able to release the feelings of anger and make way for feelings of love and peace for themselves and for the people in their lives. All 13 participants also experienced psychedelic uh, visual phenomena. However, these visions really provide a matrix through which they engage in the process of meaning making. And through these visions, elements of their lives were drawn together in new ways and allowed them to bring a sense of coherence while also expanding their self-narrative. One woman had a vision involving what she described as spirits, and she said, quote, there was light all around me, welcoming me into this new realm that I was in. She said she saw, quote, stone faces, and they were beautiful, and they would fall to dust, rise up and fall back down to dust. During the integration session, we asked her what meaning she made of this, and she said, I now think of it as the nature of life. It rises and it falls. And it was showing me that it's the essence of life. 
And through her experience, the, uh, her cancer was able to find a home amongst the very human process of rising and falling. In this proxy world with visions, participants were able to increase the bandwidth of what they were able to experience. The visual experience allowed them to achieve healing by expanding their internal space and making room to process major existential concepts. And as a result, the world became less daunting and intimidating, and they were able to integrate them into their understandings. Experiences of interconnection and, connected and connectedness led eight participants to a feeling of aliveness and wholeness, belonging and comfort within their their larger community, communities, the universe, and themselves. One person experienced feelings of being connected to everything. She says, it was, it was like being inside a drop of water, being inside of a butterfly's wing. What it made me realize was that it's all in me. It's all together. It's all just one. One thing. It's all just one. And she goes on to say, going on to say, I feel more in touch with who I really am, my real self, and myself that's connected to everyone and everything. And it's a huge comfort. Our research team um, uh, you know, felt that the degree of therapeutic experience and healing in the psilocybin session in large part depends, excuse me, um, on the willingness of the participant to face and acknowledge his or her fears and anxieties in the repressed and closed off parts of oneself and identity. In our study, over half of them, seven of them, describes um, transient psychological and emotional struggle, characterized by fear and confusion, panic. One participant described how this process is counter to the ways our culture advertises what medicine is supposed to do. This is medicine, he said, that did not quite Sorry, that did quite the opposite. It didn't make anything better. It's better. It brought out the illness into the realm of attention. It brought everything out. It was an intense struggle, and that's where it became medicinal, because it allowed that struggle to happen. It didn't code it. It wasn't antidepressant. It wasn't a just shove it under the bed and hope it doesn't come back. It all came out. One dark experience by one participant, who was a former lifeguard and swimmer, reported that she felt like she was drowning underwater. I started panicking, she said. I felt like my lungs were collapsing and not moving at all. Another participant, she described the terror that she felt at the beginning of the session. I was completely disoriented. I was maybe in the hold of a ship at sea with nothing to anchor myself to. I was lost and I was so scared. So it's important to contextualize the transformation of these difficult experiences. These same people later said, this woman who um, felt that she was rocking in a ship, she said, and then my fear just coalesced, and I mentally saw it. It was right there, and it was a big black thing right under my rib cage. My fear was there, and I was overcome with anger, with rage. And I screamed, just get out. I ejected the fear, and it was gone. And then everything changed. I just started feeling love. And then the former lifeguard, who had previously felt that she was drowning, took on a metaphor of struggling to reach oxygen. She said, I could see that there was a tiny light at the top, and I was at the bottom, and I knew that I needed to get to the top to breathe. That's what I kept feeling. I need to get to the top. I need to get to the top. And then I broke through. So in both of these examples, there's a movement toward or through the fear into a state of resolution. And many traditions recognize this uh, intrinsic value of having negative experience in the process of taking ownership of one's fears. We can find parallels in Christian theology of the dark night of the soul, uh, or Jungian psychology, integration of the shadow. Um, and our team came to understand that these difficult experiences were critical aspects of the journey towards healing. And becoming whole involves inviting the darkness in to become an equal part of one's true self. In doing so, the darkness is transformed into an ally. Um, but an important note is the importance of having developed a trusting therapeutic alliance before the psilocybin administration, at least within the context of, of this study and these studies, because um, the space provides a crucial, supportive context that allows the patient to integrate these fearful experiences. 
The lotus plant is a beautiful metaphor drawing nourishment from murky waters to create a beautiful flower, and the potential for that flower to bloom lies hidden deep within the core of that plant well before it even unfolds. All of our study participants reported experience, excuse me, experiencing benefits related to their quality of life after the treatment. They expressed coming to honor a different side of themselves, a more still emotional or spiritual side, um, usually connecting to the present moment. And patients came to remember during their psilocybin session what to them was most important about their life. And then were compelled to, compelled to orient their lives um, afterward in a way that continued to connect them to, its, to that place within them. Uh, that is nourishing. Um, and eight participants reported uh, this, this feeling of, um, of their insights arriving from an inner or enduring source that they could return to um, in ordinary consciousness. Um, so one participant described, quote, a connection with this place that I go to in myself and find peace and comfort. When I'm feeling anxious, I can tap into it through meditation. And you can't take that away from me now. It's there. Um, and then another quick quote, um, another participant said that he became aware of this huge, immeasurable, inexpressible, inexpressible vibrancy that is at the core of my life. My life is nothing more than the opportunity to express it. Here we see not the absence of anxiety, but rather an inner confidence derived from the ability to continually excuse me, continually transform naturally arising anxiety into trust in oneself. Um, and rather we strive to awaken the confidence in our innate ability to allow our anxieties to live with, within us, or live with us, excuse me, in unity and wholeness. I'll leave you with a, a quote by Kierkegaard. This is an adventure that every human being must go through to learn to be anxious in order that he may not perish. Whoever has learned to be anxious in the right way has learned the ultimate. The more profoundly he is in anxiety, the greater is the man. Then anxiety enters into his soul and searches out everything and anxiously torments every finite and petty out of him. And then it leads him where he wants to go. at least three or four participants out of the seven who had difficult experience did need, I wouldn't say an intervention, but they did need the, uh, relied on the support of their, of their therapist to, um, I guess, make them feel safe enough to surrender into the difficult experience, which um, then sort of inherently um, uh, shifted. And there were sessions I showed you in the, um, in this, the timeline, uh, a lot of preparatory sessions. So there was a lot of trust building before the you know, before the psilocybin session. And the woman who, um, you know, I, I didn't have enough room to include this, but the woman who was rocking in a ship and um, then ejected her fear, you know, sort of merging with her fear, um, and who, where, which was lodged under her rib cage, she actually had to reach out to her therapist, and they held her hands um, and just. Trust it, or, and, and said, you know, just trust it, and we're here. So um, that supportive context and container is, is very important. And um, uh, even in other traditions where uh, you know psychedelics or entheogens are used, um, there usually is a is a context um, for these experiences, supportive context that um, recognizes the you know, recognizes the difficult experience. And that being said. Not every difficult experience results in a, um, a resolution. Some can, um, there's a term called spiritual emergency, um, you know, that can arise and without you know, the appropriate um, attention uh, to, to help integrate or to, to treat, um, you know, the, uh, integrate the content that emerges. It can be really harmful and dangerous. So, um, so yeah, so in our study, our, um, our therapists were, were really prepared to, to ease, to help um, the person facilitate their own um, uh, you know, transition through.
Our team's background, the lens through which we understood these experiences was an existential humanistic framework. But generally speaking, everyone had some existential, so existential meaning, um, you know, pondering um, the meaning of life and having cancer really provoked this crisis of meaning for many people. So that's why we chose um, that specific framework. Absolutely. In our study, there were some death experiences. There was a range of um, stages of cancer, but um, there, you know, a lot of there are there are many scientists and theorists in the field who believe that psychedelics um, there's hold a lot of value, um, great value in um, preparing people for death. Um, you know, and for some people. Um, that confrontation with death, that um, uh, real uh, kind of rehearsal of death can really um, help them live more in the present moment um, because we're all going to die. <laughs> and, uh, you know, psychedelics really um, do unlock these, um, these sort of primal, or tend to unlock these primal fears that we have um, related to our mortality. So, um, so yes, it's, it's very, it is pretty common, um, you know, even for people who are healthy to have death experiences. Um, there were actually a lot of, uh, it's different, but ego loss um, experiences in our study about um, like eight or nine, um, which is really sort of a death of your ego, um, which is, is different, but it's, it's common to have a, you know, some experience, some sort of big traumatic loss confronting it and then moving into a state of uh, sort of experiential insight or, or wisdom derived from, from the experience that is able to sort of in tra translate and integrate into their lives and um, help them become more sort of fully engaged in their, in their, their life before, before death. About a third of our participants were atheists. Actually, the woman for the rocking ship, she was an atheist, staunch atheist, and even after the study was a staunch atheist. She said that um, her experience was, was spiritual. There was um, some connection to a um, like a higher you know, part of herself, and she didn't def you know, articulate it in terms of um, like a religious experience. But um, being atheist, uh, it may change. I think the language, the vernacular that is used to describe the experience, but it, it seems to not necessarily change um, the profundity. Um, of the experience.